from Penn State and uh, And you are not going to talk about single cell data. Okay, I'm, so this I'm is the one no. before the law. Okay. Oh. There we are. Okay, so thanks. Um, as Farhat said, I'm, I'm changing topics here to protein DNA interactions, um, and specifically how we're trying to characterize protein DNA complexes from a collection of chip exo data sets. Um, is the volume okay on this? Everyone, everyone good? Yeah, okay. Um, so just in case, uh, for those of you that don't know about ChIP-EXO or the related uh, ChIP-Nexus protocol from, from the Zeitlinger lab, uh, the main difference between this and ChIP-Seq is that we use a five prime to three prime exonuclease to digest fragments of DNA. Oh my God, I keep pressing that thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to digest fragments of DNA back to protein DNA cross-linking points. So our sequencing reads are starting just upstream of protein DNA cross-linking points. Um, this results in uh, much sharper data, much uh, higher spatial resolution than the corresponding ChIP-seq protocol. Um, but I want to keep emphasizing here that what we're characterizing here at the center of these peaks are protein DNA cross-linking points. And why that's important, why we think that's important, is that different proteins will cross-link to DNA in different ways, depending on the relative availability of cross-linkable residues. So for different proteins, you might see different cross-linking signatures in the corresponding chip exo data. So my lab has been trying to leverage this over the past few years in different ways. Uh, for example, if you are characterizing transcription factor A with a uh, chip exo um, uh, experiment, and let's imagine that transcription factor A is binding directly to DNA at some sites and binding indirectly at other sites. You may expect to see some different uh, chip exo um, patterns underlying each of these different subtypes of binding sites because formaldehyde will crosslink um, transcription factor A differently where it's uh, binding directly to DNA versus the protein protein um, crossings that are. Um, relying, or sorry, that, are, that, are, that result from the, from the indirect uh, binding mode. So earlier this year, we published a, a paper describing a platform that can take a single chip exo experiment and break down different binding subtypes um, according to these different types of patterns that might appear. I'm not going to uh, talk more about that particular method. You can find it in the paper. Um, what I want to do today is try and extend this idea out a bit to think about complexes uh, in collections of chip exo data sets, not just a single chip exo data set. So let's imagine that we have a collection of chip exo data sets and we're looking for complexes. And let's imagine that biologically there exists some complex of A, B, and C. Um, what would the corresponding chip exo data look like under these different uh, uh, transcription factors? So let's say that A and B are, are directly cross-linked to DNA and C is indirectly cross-linked. Of course, you would see A's cross-linking pattern where A is cross-linked. You'd see B's cross-linking pattern where B is cross-linked. Um, However, so, so first of all, you should see clusters of binding sites for A and B, clusters of peaks that are spatially proximal to each other um, in a recur recurring fashion along the genome. However, we also think that there might be cross-linking echoes in this data, right? So what I mean by that is because A and B are crossing together, you should see an echo of, of B's cross-linking signature in A's chip exo data, and likewise, uh, likewise B in A, or A and B, and C should be a mixture maybe of both of these cross-linking uh, patterns because it's crossing to DNA through both of these uh, direct binders. So if we have a collection of chip exo data, we should be able to look for um, proteins that first of all have peaks located nearby one another, and secondly, um, we may be able to leverage this sort of echoing pattern to tell something about the organization of those proteins within a complex. Right? So, so first of all, we have a large collection of chip exo data available to look for potential complexes like this. Uh, this is a project that uh, Frank Pugh and I have been working on over the last few years. We call it the Yeast Epigenome Project, or YEP for short. So in this project, we're trying to characterize with chip exo the uh, genome-wide um, binding patterns of every protein uh, localized in the, in the yeast nucleus. So we've done about 800 proteins so far. Um, about, well, just over half of them work well, 
give a strong signal. A lot of the ones that don't give a strong signal are, turn out to be enzymes that you wouldn't expect to bind specifically in specific patterns along the, uh, the DNA in the first place. Um, what I'm showing here is one view on the data. This is cycling through lots of different proteins that we've characterized with ChIP-EXO here. What we're looking at are all genes in the yeast genome organized from shortest up to longest, and we're centering the plots on the, on the midpoint of the genes. This sort of bell shape that you see in the plots is, is actually the transcription start site and end site. Um, so you can see that these different proteins are organized in this space in many very different ways, right? So we'll take these data sets and we're going to try and uh, characterize protein DNA complexes out of this entire collection. So how would we do that? If we're given these, this number of data sets, how would we first of all go and, and try and find potential complexes? First of all, we want to find uh, proteins that are uh, commonly sharing peaks in the same region, right? That where the peaks are co-occurring, in other words, in the same regions. We could use a clustering method for this, right? We could use a, a hard clustering method, let's say a state-based method, like Chrome HMM or something like that, to characterize different states. However, this isn't going to work very well for the following reason, right? Um, imagine we have two complexes here, one of which is uh, transcriptional initiation associated, the other which is transcriptional termination associated. These will have uh, chip exo patterns, uh, peaks along the genome. Um, a state-based model would be able to find potential complexes in this place, in this space, um, at regions where these complexes exist alone, right? So you'd have some high probability here for the transcriptional initiation components, and likewise for the ter termination components here. But these states will not represent regions where these uh, complexes are overlapping very well, right? So for example here, um, so in a state-based model, the states might try to represent these regions with a whole other state, which doesn't itself represent something that, that exists as a complex in, in DNA. It's just an overlapping pair of complexes, for example. Um, this situ situation where stuff overlaps because we have lots of proteins, and this is a fairly compact genome, this happens quite a lot. An alternative approach to, to hard clustering, to state-based uh, clustering, is, is topic modeling, which I think we're going to hear a lot more from uh, Steinertz later. Um, in topic models, we imagine that we're generating documents um, where we're pulling words for that document out of a mixture of different states, of, uh, a mixture of different topics. Um, a, given to a given document can be generated by multiple topics. In our analogy here, and this is work that uh, Gurai Kusu is doing in my lab, um, in our analogy, our documents are short windows on the genome. The words for the documents are protein chip exo reads. And so we're, we're modeling um, different topics that we're interpreting as being potential complexes or subcomplexes within this um, data, okay? And this, we find, turns out to model the data better, at least in terms of interpretability about uh, complexes and subcomplexes than hard clustering based methods would. So we take this approach and we apply it to the entire data set. So we have, this, this method is a non-parametric method. It estimates there's 175 topics in here. We have 784 proteins on here. Each one of these uh, red blocks represents the over-representation of particular proteins within particular topics. And again, we're interpreting these topics as being potential complexes. Um, we can look at individual topics and see if they make sense in terms of being complexes. Um, so many of them do. Um, so for example, here's TF2D. Uh, what I'm showing over here is the protein-protein interaction evidence from StringDB. I mean, uh, uh, TF2D shouldn't be uh, controversial, but um, some of the others, um, you know, I'm, we're showing some evidence here in, in support. So this is TF2D, here's the PAF1 complex, here's uh, SWIR1, um, here's location where, or here's some topics where the same protein can be involved in multiple topics, perhaps um, playing a separate regulatory role in each. So for example, RAP1 here uh, is involved in a topic alongside the SAGA complex, and a separate topic uh, with uh, NHP6A and a couple of other proteins. Um, once we have topics characterized, we can uh, look at their spatial distribution along the genome, see which genes they're associated with, see which other topics they're associated with. So for example, for these RAP1 topics, one of them is more highly associated with ribosomal protein gene regulation in, in yeast, obviously. Um, we can look at what other topics follow, or 
are, are co-associated in the same spaces with, these, uh, with this topic. For example, these other four topics follow this RAP1 uh, topic in a spatially determined uh, manner at these uh, ribosomal protein genes. When we look into the details of what these other topics are, they make sense in terms of being um, other subcomplexes uh, that are known to regulate ribosomal protein genes. Um, just as an aside here, given that this is a fairly complete, or we hope it's a fairly complete uh, representation of an entire cell type's epigenome, um, one interesting thing that we can do is make statements about the absence of observations, right? So, um, so what I'm showing here are, are combinations of topics. We've just lumped together some topics to get, um, that are all associated with promoter or upstream uh, regions. These are all, um, all topics that are highly associated with upstream regions. And then we're grouping different genes here. So there's four and a half thousand genes here that are... Uh, dominated by different types of topic combinations. So what we can see here is there's a group of genes, for example, that are, seem to be dominated by chromatin organizing factors like REB1, ABF1, and RISC. Um, there's another set of genes that seem to be more dominated by just general sequence-specific transcription factors, just every other type of sequence-specific factor in yeast. However, there's a large set of genes down here where there doesn't seem to be much at all happening in the upstream regions. Um, and we can say there's not much happening because we think we have fairly comprehensive knowledge of what's going on. However, in these unbound genes, there's still the pre-initiation complex, and many of them are still driving mRNA transcription. So it's sort of interesting to think about um, how they're regulated if there's no sequence-specific factors upstream of them. Okay, in my last couple of minutes here, I want to return to this idea of we have a complex, can we tell something about its spatial organization, of its structural organization, uh, just from the chip exodata itself? So for this, I want to focus on an example where we have uh, tRNA genes in yeast, and we have several topics that we see uh, organized at these genes. These are all topics that make sense. They're TF3B, uh, TF3C, POL3, right? So, so these are all, you know, correspond to the known uh, regulatory uh, complexes for tRNAs. Once we have these collections of proteins, these potential complexes, uh, can we reconstruct something about the organization of the proteins within those complexes? So for this, Naomi Yamada in my lab is, uh, has a method where she takes the uh, chip exo data sets underlying these potential topics. She performs a type of multiple alignment on these, uh, on these data, where we take all regions where these topics are highly associated, highly um, occurring. So these are all the tRNA genes here, for example. Um, the alignment aligns the chip exo data. It's not working with sequence at all. It's just aligning the, the chip exo data across all these regions in a, in a consistent way across all the proteins that we're analyzing. So what this results in is uh, an aligned chip exo cross-linking profile across all the regions where that, uh, those topics are, are uh, or th these complexes are located, and again, consistently across all proteins. Uh, just as an aside again, you can see what I was talking about here a little bit in terms of the cross-linking echoes. That are, so for example, POL3 is, not, um, is, is recruited via uh, TF3B and TF3C, and you can see it shares some features of the cross-linking patterns of both of those subcomplexes, right? Um, okay, so once we have these profiles, we can run them through a fairly simple mixture model where we're trying to characterize the individual cross-links within this space. So we have uh, a mixture model where we try, to um, we try to estimate the relative locations and strengths of the cross-links in each of the uh, proteins. And again, in a consistent way across the entire complex. So what this will result in is essentially what we call a cross-linking matrix. Again, we have the positions of each of the cross-links within this uh, profile and the relative strengths for each of the proteins that we're analyzing. Um, and we think this cross-linking matrix can tell us something about the, the structural organization of the components within the complex. For example, I mean, we haven't really done hugely complicated things with this yet, but for example, if we just apply a very simple uh, dimensionality reduction like PCA, uh, we start recapitulating some of the known organization of the, uh, of, of the subcomplexes within this uh, regulatory uh, conglomerate, I guess. So, for example, the TF2B are located up here. Um, TF3C subcomponents are over here, and POL3 is spread between them. 
Um, more importantly, we can take all the other proteins that came down with this topic that we hadn't thought about being regulating uh, tRNA genes before, um, measure their cross-linking affinities and uh, embed them in the same space and get some hypotheses generated here about wh uh, who they might be interacting with to regulate tRNA genes if they are indeed doing so. Okay, so with that, um, I'm just about on time. Um, just in summary, we have this comprehensive data set uh, generated. We're still digging into the details of it. It'll be uh, publicly available, hopefully sooner than later. Um, and we're, we're going to try and provide as many different views on this data as possible. And of course, all the raw data for people to play with. Um, we think that topic modeling is a good way of, uh, of estimating complexes within this space. And what I should have said earlier is we're not the first to think about this um, a type of approach. For example, the Elemental Lab uh, years ago did uh, some uh, NMF to, to come up with complexes from ENCODE chip seq data. And my uh, former uh, postdoc advisor, Dave Gifford, also did some stuff with topic modeling before. The big difference here is the resolution, right? We, we're really modeling every 20 base pair window on the entire genome, whereas those previous efforts were dealing with uh, many hundreds of base pairs. Um, and hopefully we're getting towards structural organization uh, questions with the cross-linking analysis. I want to thank everyone in my lab and the Pew Lab that was involved in this, uh, NIGMS and NSF for funding, and there's postdoc positions available. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, really nice talk. Um, so how, how do you think you can deal with the fact that uh, you're uh, having, I mean, looking at bulk um, of cells, and so maybe you're looking at events which are not co-occurring oh, sure. in the sure. same cells, right? I mean, you can find, you can have two competitive factors, and some cell, in some cells it will be bound, one will be bound in another cell, another one, and you're bringing them as being in a complex. Absolutely. How do you think you can deal with that? I, this I'm is not sure we can, right? No, sure. This is the big uh, caveat with all chip-based data sets at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't think we can necessarily, although I'd, I'd counter that maybe if, we, if you had a case like that, you wouldn't see the same cross-syncing patterns in, in these alternate complexes. But I don't, at the same time, we're not modeling that here either. So, yeah, take your point. So, great talk. I was wondering, with this method, uh, how would you be able to tell if you were missing any critical transcription factors that are binding to DNA? Yeah, very good question. Um, because this is comprehensive, but if we didn't hit absolutely everything that we know should be binding uh, DNA at the same time. Um, I don't think we can, is the honest answer. I don't think we, we'd necessarily know that we're, there's something should be in that complex that we're just not seeing. Uh, right. <laughs> so we, 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 I don't know, we'd have to generate more data and keep trying. <laughs> Thank you, though. Oh, very nice work. So I was uh, curious, uh, so it's basically looking at all the transcription factors in yeast and uh, seems it's, I'm super excited about this data set whenever it's going to be available. I was curious, uh, have you compared this with the Mac Isaac, uh, so now going to the network level, transcription factor target, how does it actually compare and uh, do you have plans to look at like, you know, functional impact like comparing to these other knockdown yep. kinds of experiments? And so, which condition is this, and do you plan to look at other conditions as well? Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So each in turn. So we've compared against the McIsaac. We were, remember that was chip chip data that was promoter focused. We we see very good correlation with those peaks that were being called, and in many cases we're deconvolving those into multiple peaks. Um, there's a very good overlap. It's the same cell lines basically. You know, these are the tap tagged cell lines that they used back then. The beauty of yeast is that we don't have to worry about antibodies in that case, right? Every protein has a tap tag line. Um, these are uh, standard growth conditions um, for the comprehensive set. We've been following up with some heat shock and some other perturbations, but not as comprehensively yet. There's definitely changes that are induced by uh, environmental stresses. Um, some proteins will not bind in the normal conditions and bind under stress, et cetera. Um, and what was the third part? Comparison with knockdown, like yeah, if you knock haven't down done too much of that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.